Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to regularly scheduled meeting of the South County EMS Board of Oversight that was rescheduled. It was called to order at 6 o'clock, 6.01. Chief? All right. Um, everybody's had a chance to review the minutes from the last meeting. Okay, is there a motion? I motion we approve the minutes from Second. the last meeting. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Bear with me while I take minutes. <laughs> So, what do we have? Chief's report, I believe. I'm going to link the report to the website so that it's viewable by anybody who's so inclined to look. Um, so, I don't want to give subtitles. When, you, when you say website? Um, South County EMS website. Oh, okay. I didn't even know we had a website. We do. Um, so, they need some real revision. <clears throat> that, that's another work in progress. Okay, so, by the numbers here, um, March 2024 calls to date were uh, just shortly shy of the end of the third quarter on the end of the month. We've done 119 responses this month. That represents a 16.6 .6 increase compared to uh, this month last year, which was 102 calls. Third quarter, um, so looking at that, just looking at the data, um, these are no, these numbers are <clears throat> no real surprise. Um, I broke it out by community for you so you could see where we go. Um, and our numbers are surprisingly not that moved, right? Uh, we did do an increase in mutual aid over the month, which was the plan, um, because we wanted to kind of see, like, what does this do to our uh, primary response area? Are we meeting those call obligations and still able to provide mutual aid, or do we need to scale it back? So the short answer to that is we have absolutely met our mutual response aid. Um, it's a little difficult to get exact numbers on that uh, because if you don't track that, they have to come from Shelburne. So that request is out, but I'll get that to you. But uh, I, I don't suspect it's more than any typical month. So what that means for us is we've been able to achieve an enormous amount of mutual aid beyond normal. I think there's plenty of room for more. Um, and that's revenue generating. Now, they're not paying into assessments, but... Uh, we do build these calls out, um, so that's really fantastic. Um, mutual aid across all communities uh, accounted for just shy of 32% of our volume uh, throughout the month, uh, with the, you know, the vast majority of them going to Greenfield, um, as we would anticipate. Um, looking at third quarter response totals uh, for mutual aid in the third quarter, <clears throat> Of the fiscal year, we've done 358 calls. That's a 20.9% increase compared to the third quarter of fiscal year 23. <clears throat> and kind of as we march it out looking over the third quarter, uh, you know, you've only had to put up with me for um, not even two months of this. So th this graph will look different, I'm sure, but as it stands right now, uh, this is looks kind of just like the month of March did, right? Uh, there's not a lot of variation there. So, so Chief, have you talked to the other other departments, and what has been the response? What talk, have you heard? Talked to a couple of them, and they most commonly share a lot of frustration um, in the limited availability of advanced life support difficulties funding their own BLS transport capabilities in their own communities, 
And it's kind of one of the interesting things I've learned since starting here is just how incredibly difficult it can be to get an ambulance at any level in Franklin County, uh, depending on circumstances. It's going to show up, but it might take a, a really long time, and it's anybody's guess as to what level of response uh, there is in that. So, actually, I think I think that's very important to to reiterate many times, Chief, because that that's what the the um, the Rousseaus and the Stones and the Ahearns were telling us 12, 15 years ago. And that's why South County was actually, that's why it was formed. And it's, it, it appears from, from what we see that it's still needed, and, but you just reiterated that. Yeah, and so uh, I think in Franklin County we're in, um, I won't say a completely unique situation, but we're in a good situation where we are able to, uh, as of today, able to meet the vast majority of our own call demand and remain available to assist other communities who need us. We rely on them to come in too, uh, to cover us when we're out. I mean, you know, another way to maybe look at this is no single agency I'm pretty sure anywhere in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts right now is capable of handling their own call volume. That includes metropolitan areas, Boston, Worcester, Springfield. Um, it includes small towns and everything in between. So when we talk about EMS delivery, it really is a, it takes a village mindset. Um, and it all does work out. Um, Sometimes what, what we do uh, to try and make it efficient is to not crisscross traffic and to take units out of service for longer than is necessary, send them further away than is needed. And you know that really relies on a lot of cooperation and collaboration uh, between department heads um, to say, hey, what can we do to improve this? Um, we're very lucky in that not only are we able to meet our own calls, but when we do require mutual aid, uh, we get a, a, a really good response. Uh, that's fantastic. A lot of the communities that we respond to, it takes us a while to get there because it's like, just like heat. Really, far he's, so long, he's so long away, way from right? Here. Um, Even Asheville's a long <clears throat> way. Huh? Asheville, all <clears throat> those are a long way. And, you know, I'm happy to, you know, I mean, look, the way I see it is I've got, you know, a crew sitting here that's not doing anything. Um, let's send them, right? There's somebody out there who needs our services. We're very fortunate to have this service. Let's get them out there um, and do it. And if somebody needs to come in to cover us, then, you know, it will all work out. But um, so far, things are really in our favor. So, I mean... I wrote about this in the um, in the annual report uh, for our, our little South County EMS blurb that goes in the town uh, annual reports, uh, which should be coming out in the near future, um, just about the work that the founders of this organization and the effort that went into it, it's paying off. And we're in this immensely good position right now to not only take care of ourselves, but to actually do a bigger job regionally, being very slow in our approach to it, being data driven in our approach to it. And that can help offset the cost of our own operation. So that's that's kind of the overall goal. And you know. It's a slow road to get there, but you know we're seeing that. So third quarter, uh, we're seeing a good increase. That's to be expected. Uh, if we look at the fiscal year to date uh, response totals, uh, the dark blue line on the very top is the current fiscal year. And you can see it only goes through March. Uh, but calls are increasing. You know, there's always going to be seasonal peaks and val uh, valleys for sure. But what we're looking at overall is each year the line stacks a little bit higher 
And this is not because we're doing an excess of mutual aid. This is just because we're doing more of our own homegrown calls. People, we may not have bigger populations, we may, but commerce and business will always increase and highway traffic increases and all of these things happen. That, I mean, everywhere sees this. This is not exclusive to South County. Um, anywhere you look, it just gets busier and busier every single year and we're seeing that. Now, these actual numbers represented aren't huge. Um, you know, this can be the difference between five to 10 calls in a month, right? So it's, it's very doable. Um, don't let the graph kind of scare you. But um, that's kind of where we're headed. And uh, that leaves us in a really good position. So compared to um, fiscal year 23, uh, through the end of the third quarter, that's a 16.5% increase. Our total call volume in fiscal year 23 was 1,286. Year to date now is 1,060. We're actually, we just went out, so it's 1,061. Um, that's a mutual aid call to Conway. Um, so it's trending in the right direction. Uh, it's looking like by the end of fourth quarter this year, we'll definitely exceed our fiscal year 23 call totals. Um, the good thing is we're seeing that reflected in revenues. Well, that was one of the concerns also, Chief, is that during COVID, our, our calls fell off. And we, and not, not say we were hoping our, our volume would go back up, but there, there was a concern that, that our volume wouldn't go back up because people got used to not calling the ambulance. So I, I'm glad people are calling the ambulance and it reflects in the numbers that you're seeing. And, and because I think they get better care when they call the ambulance, quicker care, better care, and quality of life. If there's a serious, serious issue, much better quality of life if, if the ambulance gets there quicker. That's why we're here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm actually, I'm not glad that you're up, but I'm glad that people are taking advantage of the services that we do offer. Definitely. I think when we started this, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say we had about 700 calls a year between the three towns. We did. That was right, yeah. So we're looking, if these numbers hold true, we're looking at doubling that. Yeah. And when we built the service, the model that Bruce provided us with was a model for about 1,000 calls a year. Right. So everything being true, I know we've added a couple positions along the way, but essentially that model for 1,000 has yep. held up almost, you know, if, if it holds true, 1,400 calls. And I was amazed at how accurate his projections were. Like he had a crystal ball in this. He thing. did. Right, Gear? Yep. <laughs> I mean, he did. Well, the interesting thing, too, is that in, in this fiscal year, there's been no month where you've had fewer than 100 calls. So, you know, that's yeah. projecting out, you know, you're looking at 1,400 pr pretty easily. And considering the mild winter we've had where we haven't had major that many snowstorms mm -hmm. cool. yeah we're like i said we're in a really good position um so i did meet with chief Brunel on uh, turner's falls we had an outstanding discussion um and it was not only helpful for me um to uh, gain a better understanding of some of the um, mutual aid um How should I put this? The way that mutual aid is performed uh, in the area, uh, it was really valuable for me. Um, you know, I would love to go to him and say, hey, I'll do primary mutual aid right now, but we're just not in the position to do that right yet. Um, I think <coughs> uh, that is a goal of mine that I would like to see, and I think Turner's Falls is a really good community to do that. We're, we're so close. Um, and right now they're in a very bizarre situation. Um, I don't believe that we're going to get an assessment out of them, nor is that what they're really looking for. They have their own basic life support ambulance service through the fire department. But just kind of to compare what other agencies are looking at right now, Chief Brunel right now um, has three guys on during the day. And if they get an EMS call, two of them are staffing an ambulance, and he's issuing a recall 
and he's paying people overtime to come in and staff the engine every single time they get a call. All right, so um, <coughs> if there's any concern about overtime here, like we don't have it bad at all, well, and I'll address overtime too. Um, but you know, right now the best I can offer him is what he's already getting through AMR out of Greenfield, which is, well, if I'm available, we'll come do it. Right, I would love to auto dispatch for ALS, um, and I'm convinced that it would more than pay for itself. Uh, we would stand to do very well through that arrangement. Plus, uh, we would be able to provide a great service. So the idea is if we do that within a couple communities, we can actually supplement our own earnings and we can really drive our assessments down. Uh, that's incredible. So um, that's what I'm tracking. That's what will trend looking at the dollars and the calls, the calls missed, and I'll just keep reporting to you on that. We'll see how it goes. I'm not pushing any buttons. Um, I'm just seeing what we can do. I have offered to uh, dispatch into the other communities that we are in fact available for intercepts. Please, if you need paramedics, we're, we're here. Uh, please call us. Uh, and so that has increased our call volume slightly, uh, which has been really good. Um, so, you know, if we were to approach that currently, we don't have the staffing necessary to even approach that. So our staffing is a really uh, interesting scenario here, and I'll go into that in just a minute. I won't take too long with this report, I promise. Um, but I really feel that if we're going to um, approach a scenario like that, we're going to need to work towards staffing ambulance two more regularly. Uh, I wouldn't start with 24-7, but I think we could strive for at least weekday consistency. Um, and if that's effective, Look in, in addition to the in addition to the impact shifting that we have, that is the impact shift. Yep, ambulance too. So we'll get to that. Okay. Moving on to finance, um, you know, Carolyn can of, of course speak to that uh, a lot better than I can. Um, but um, you know, we've done pretty well. Um, you know, our February payments applied through Comstar are. Um, just over $112,000, uh, which is really outstanding. Uh, our last deposit was just shy of $70,000. So um, that increase in mutual aid is paying off. Um, that's outstanding. Uh, other finance things, I did go and sit with uh, Town of Deerfield um, Capital Planning earlier this month, um, and we discussed the transfer of some funds from already uh, appropriated projects that were unspent um, into different projects. So uh, the first of these is we had a station exhaust system, um, which was a $30,000 amount uh, approved in, I want to say, fiscal year 22. Um, yes. And what we ended up doing was getting an offer of that same system for just the cost of installation. We were able to get a free system. Uh, so we're jumping at that opportunity. That's in process. Um, we're currently quoting out um, the vendor. I think we can get it in at under $10,000 installed, which would be amazing. And so what a victory, right? Uh, we'll jump at that. So we now have this $30,000 already appropriated that we can uh, reallocate, which is wonderful. Um, so the thing that I would like to apply that towards specifically is a station-wide alerting system to supplement our dispatch uh, and give us more information uh, when we respond to calls. So. Um, I don't know how in depth you want to go into this, but I could spend a meeting talking about it. So, so Carolyn, on, on that exhaust system, so that's something that South County was paying, not Deerfield, right? Right. Okay. 
we had put aside retained earnings. For right, I I was just wondering if yeah. that was uh, you you, I, you know what you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. About the building the versus the yeah. service yeah. and the building. <clears throat> it, and I think we ended up deciding that it should come out of retained earnings, and that's why it did come out of retained earnings. Okay, that's you know, fine. Our discussion. Yep. Nope. Fine. Um. I, I just I didn't remember back that far because yeah. like it was 2012 2012 well we actually talked about it in 21 right yes to get it yeah. so with this uh, you know free of charge system coming to us the courtesy of the Greenfield Fire Department thank you very much um, you know if we can get the installation cost uh, at under ten thousand dollars it seems reasonable to me to pay that out of the rent fund and get that installed and uh, that's going to be you know just a health and safety thing for our, our crews and that's important to do so that's the first the second is uh you want to keep it under ten thousand if you can just for procurement too correct yeah um, the, of course, there's prevailing wage and there's, you know, all these considerations, but I, I'm pretty sure we can hit that, that mark. Okay. So uh, there is also a transfer of $44,000 on spent from the fiscal year 23 cardiac monitor purchase. So uh, you'll recall that um, we were awarded the AFG grant, which paid for one of the cardiac monitors, uh, all of its accoutrement and service planning and preventative maintenance and all of that stuff. So uh, that was Lori McComb who uh, put all of that together and she did great work on that project. Um, but that left us with $44,000, which uh, is pretty outstanding. Um, so uh, what we talked about was reappropriating that $44,000 also set aside. Um, to be put towards the replacement of the Explorer we have out there. The Explorer that we have out there was a very gracious donation from Deerfield Police. It came to us um, in well-loved shape um, when we received it, and since then, um, it's it wasn't a lemon. They, they, John does pass on the lemons. No, nope, no, nope. I, I, and I'm absolutely grateful to John and, and Interfield PD for that. It's, it's a true gift. But, uh, it's, at this point, any repair that we had to make on it would exceed the value of the vehicle. Uh, and I joked at FinCon that it's held together with medical tape and rust, because it is. So, uh, legit medical tape. It does a great job. Um, so, um, I'd like to replace that vehicle, and that's going to be essential. This isn't a uh, chief's vehicle, this isn't part of my contract, this is a department asset that um, we really need to uh, have available because as we look at the schedule and as we look at our ability to provide mutual aid, a big component of that is going to be our ability to provide advanced life support in a non-transport capacity. Uh, these are calls that, uh, the basic idea here is, I want to keep ambulances available to cover our own calls. I don't want to miss our own homegrown calls. That's why we're here. But oftentimes what happens is they, other communities can get an ambulance. They can't get paramedics. So if I put a paramedic or two paramedics in a non-transport vehicle, well, then there you go. We're going to build that. We're going to build that department. We're going to more than make payroll on it. We're going to do well on that. And we haven't sacrificed our own ambulance to respond to that call. So that's, that's an outstanding thing. Now, the staffing of that is, you know, we're, we're toying with that. Um, but staffing is another thing. So that's one of them. So yeah, so, that's what I'm worried about is the staffing. I mean, you're going to have an ambulance sitting here, but no way to drive it. I mean, well, no. So we're not going to we're not going to take crews from our ambulance. That won't happen. I mean, the whole purpose is to leave that ambulance staffed so that it's available for uh, our calls. Or if um, primary transport mutual aid is requested, then of course, right. But uh, really, the idea is cover our communities, right. Um, but be able to capture revenue and assist other communities um, 
who request advanced life support services without sacrificing our commitment uh, to our three towns. Right? Matt, is that what Hoyoke Hospital used to do with there? Yes. Is yeah. that what they, they, that's what they did, right? Yeah, I trained on that truck. So, did you? Yeah. And I believe them. the old Mercy Ambulance for a while used to send folks. Okay. In a but I, I, I remember, they because I, I used to play softball right across the street, and you would see that yeah. truck go out all right. the time, so the, the was, blazer or whatever yeah. it was. It was a single staffed, or a single person on that vehicle, because I drove that vehicle more times than I can count. They'd come, their paramedic would hop on the ambulance, and then one of the basic EMTs would hop off the ambulance once they had all their equipment into the ambulance and drive that vehicle to the hospital. So you'd have separate med kits and... It would be its own completely stocked uh, advanced life support vehicle. The way that I would like to go about it is I would like to register it as an ALS EFR versus a classified ambulance because I don't have the garage space to keep it indoors. So the difference there is with the EFR, one, it costs less. Um, and I don't have to carry all of the equipment that a classified ambulance would carry, <clears throat> which is reasonable. I don't need to be carrying backboards and bed pans and urinals. And stair the, chairs, know, none of that. Stair yeah. chairs and, you know, all of the things that an ambulance really should have. I'm, this is just going to be a truck with ALS first in bags, drugs, cardiac monitor, things like that. The stuff that, you know, we're, we're going to be jumping into somebody else's ambulance that already has all of that stuff. Right. So, so, so Chief, when you when you think about going to that step, I would say you may not have the ability to store that truck here now, but don't don't hesitate to talk to the communities about taking one of your your third ambulance and put it in one of our public safety buildings mm -hmm. so that you can keep it here, and then. So, and we've done that before also, the, the, the three communities. We've stored, we've stored the <coughs> ambulances and their facilities. Yeah, that's a really good thought. Um, or even store that vehicle, and when people come on shift, they pick it up from wherever, leave their car there, and return it there at the end of the shift, yeah, too. I, well, I'm just saying that, that right. you don't have, cause I, cause you, you have to maintain temperature, what, 55, 60 degrees, whatever it is. So you don't want to park during the winter time. You'd want to park it here, Correct. and you could leave it in, leave the ambulance in Sunderland, Whiteley, Deerfield, South Deer, whatever, sure. and and then so you would have that vehicle here because you didn't need that third vehicle. Correct. So and and, and that's possible. <clears throat> the other thing with the EFR is because it's all portable equipment. What I can do is I can bring the medical equipment, the medications, the monitor, all of that yep. indoors when it's not being just used. time though, Chief. And just time. That's it. You know, just time. So, uh, so that's one thing. We estimate the project to run roughly seventy-five thousand uh, dollars because I think, uh, in line with Deerfield goals uh, and my own goals, I really want to pursue being an electric vehicle. Uh, so we do talk about the installation of charging uh, infrastructure here at the station somewhere, um, and that technology has gotten so efficient and so good and so accessible that at this point to not pursue it is just political. Uh, the technology is there, so uh, let's pursue that and set the curve. Yeah, you definitely want to talk with um, Eversource. They're the provider here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they have programs and stuff where you pay for the equipment, they do the installations, things like that. Um, I know that they're giving us a rebate for the Leary lot, right? Yeah. I, for electric? Yeah. Yeah, for, for electric. Chargers. Electric chargers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that comes out of the rental income anyway. I mean, we're going to get out of the rent. Yeah. Right, but I'm just saying, if they'll oh, yeah. do the, yeah. in, the installation stuff. Yes. Yeah. Is there any, if we do this, is there any opportunity for grant money to do solar outside here? Well, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, there's a, a, a new level of commitment to green transition that changes a lot of the codes. It makes it a lot more onerous on contractors to build stuff, but then you make yourself available for being able to get solar panels paid for and stuff. But I don't think we're going to be doing that this year, maybe next year. 
Yeah, and I'm not saying it has to be today. I just yeah. I only throw it out there because if there's if we make I guess if we socialize it and Deerfield's got a grant writer. Yes, planner. If we could let that person know if they see or hear of anything, we'd be interested. I don't know what how much of the property we own the, the whole thing back to the woods. Yeah, to the tree to, to the tree. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I know south is that way, and the roof may not be the ideal spot, but you could probably do a ground mounted. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know what the limitations are for, you know, wetland kind okay. of stuff. I don't know if you have to have the same. Because it's you're not, it's not pervious. I mean, impervious. Right. So right. there'd be a there'd be a process you'd go through, but it's um, you can have a ten percent disturbance in a wetland and not necessarily have a problem. It's the question of how much of the s solar doesn't hit the wetland or whatever. But that's a small detail. Okay. We can figure that out. Yeah, just a thought. Yep. I, I would be highly supportive of that. I mean, that, that's just the right move to make, and we'll only help us recover costs down the road. Um, that, that, and plus, I just think as a, uh, a healthcare agency, it makes sense to do things that actually, <clears throat> in some way, improve the health of the environment. So um, that's a really great example. Yeah, also helpful. I see places that use them as uh, they park underneath them. Yeah, yes. you know, they park your outside vehicle under there. If you're using that as a right. paramedic intercept, that's rather right. these guys out there shoveling a foot of snow off it. You know, yeah, no, park, that's a great idea. You know, yeah. Parking underneath there. It's pretty typical to see that at police stations, and a lot of the uh, newer schools are being built with that infrastructure. With the covered with parking. Yeah, yeah. isn't that? Well, the way yeah. NASA is done with covered parking and solar panels. Yeah. Yeah. We, nine, yeah, we got almost seven I mean, it cuts ones. down on your filing bills and oh, everything. Yeah. Yeah. You're sanding, you're salting. It's outstanding. Good so. yeah. idea. Oh, that's no. a, yeah, that's a good example. The jail has really saved a lot of money. All yeah. right, we're also looking at the transfer of $2,500 from the 2022 AFG towards the replacement of our oldest ambulance structure. The remainder will have to be funded from retained earnings. This is kind of a thing that we don't really have a choice. With that stretcher is end of life. Uh, Stryker will no longer uh, do any repairs on it. Um, it's time to go. Um, it's ancient. Um, it needs to be replaced. So if there's uh, an issue with it, we can't fix it. And I don't want to run into an issue. It's not safe to put a patient on at this point. We can still use it, but if it breaks, I can't fix it. So. That needs to be replaced. Uh, so they did approve that request, and um, you know, or you know, vote to support it. So uh, we'll see what that looks like. Uh, moving it forward. went. It did go through the public hearing, and uh, the select board finance committee had a public hearing. So chances are, it's fine. So she did. Is yeah. did you talk before about leasing that equipment, or would that would that be something that you would consider <coughs> leasing? So I think if we need to come up with a lot of equipment quickly, uh, a, a lease program is ideal. Um, I brought up the alternative of purchasing expensive equipment through a lease uh, deal. But I think where it comes to stretchers, that's something I want to own uh, as an organization. Uh, it does put the burden of the annual maintenance on us as well. Um, but um, <clears throat> I don't want somebody's janky stretcher um, that I have no control over uh, anywhere near my patients or uh, our fleet. Uh, this is something I, I want our own stuff. So and what's the life expectancy of them? We're looking probably 10 years, and ours is <clears throat> 18 years old. It okay. still cracks me up. You know, they won't support it after 10 years, but then they'll take them and Lease them all to you. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So that, that's it precisely <laughs> what I'm worried about, right? Yeah. So I was in Puerto Rico on vacation a couple weeks ago, and now I know where the old van style ambulances go. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots in Puerto Rico, and you could Portsmouth, you know, all these town, and they just they don't repay wipe them. over them and put a new name on it, and you kind of still see the outline. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me pour through this because uh, I've got a lot. Um, the last uh, finance uh, fin or uh, capital thing was we withdrew the request for the funding to replace the uh, ambulance power load system. Um, 
we don't need it. Um, I think what had happened was, uh, I think a sales rep had convinced folks that maybe we did need it, but in fact, it's fine. So uh, I'm very confident in it. Um, it's inexpensive to repair. It's well within its usable lifespan. So it saves some money on that. So we withdrew that request. Looking at staffing, um, we still have a challenge staffing ambulance too. This is the impact shift. Uh, the schedule that this runs is typically nine to five, except Wednesdays, occasional or Thursdays, occasional Wednesdays, where it turns into a 16-hour shift. Um, <clears throat> uh, the schedule here um, makes very little sense to me, and the crew members really enjoy the schedule, and I, I understand why. It basically means they can work a 24-hour shift and two eight-hour shifts, sometimes combining those two eight-hour shifts into a double, a 16-hour shift. So they're working between two to three days a week. The schedule works over a five-week rotation. At the end of that, in the fifth week of that, they essentially get an eight-day break with no work. And so they love it. But they also hate it because it's confusing. My personal take on scheduling, and this won't be popular with our employees, is I don't believe 24-hour shifts to be safe. None of us do. None of us do. I despise them, and it, um, I would love to see them go away. That being said, if we just scale back and look at our, our impact shift, um, the impact shift has been completely unfilled for 11 shifts just out of this month, leaving us with one ambulance during the day, which to me is unacceptable. Um, we should at least have a second truck up during the daytime in the midweek when we're busiest. On top of that, um, eight of those 11 days where a, the impact truck was not up and running, there was one crew member staffing the truck. Now this kind of lights a fire under me because uh, I, I don't want to take anybody's hours, right? But I'm paying one person to come in here, not have a partner, and not be able to do ambulance calls. That is a result of that schedule. Why are we, why are we having problems with it? I mean, this is kind of the first we've heard about that. So, um, uh, well, I mean, it's the first I'm bringing it up to you. I'm, you know, I'm just I'm kind of starting to identify things <coughs> the longer I'm here. And I don't, I don't mean you, but I meant. I can't speak to anything that happened prior to me. Um, okay. Uh, I know well, the problem. The employees mm -hmm. liked it, so they weren't going to bring it yeah. up to you. So I, I do have some. Uh, I think we do have an opportunity to improve the schedule. Um, we have a staff meeting tomorrow um, with our employees, and one of the things that I'd like to do is throw a couple of potential solutions at them. I'm not going to be democratic about it, um, but I am going to take their input. <clears throat> if there are any, you know, any lines in the sand that are going to be a I can't work here if we do this. Well, then I'm not going to do that, right? Unless it's the only possibility. But I don't think we're going to run into that. Uh, just kind of talking to everybody at the organization, I don't see any of the potential solutions as being a problem. I'm still looking to get them working three days a week, down to 12 hour shifts if possible. The problem with that is. <clears throat> Right now, um, the way that they're employed as bylaw employees is they're subject to not only the class comp uh, from the Deerfield bylaws, but on top of that, um, their work hours are very defined. So if we strictly followed the Deerfield personnel bylaws, they work five days a week and they work eight hours, end of story. 
Well, that doesn't work for our organization. So we're already being selective about what we choose to follow and choose not to. And that's not being done maliciously. We're a 24-7 operation. It's an emergency service. That cannot apply to us. The way that the class comp approaches uh, pay for people is based on substantially equivalent work. This is not substantially equivalent work to any other position in town. Now, some of the other employees within the town uh, that you could argue do have substantially equivalent work have collective bargaining agreements. We don't care. I'd like to keep it that way, um, but I'm also not opposed if they want to do that. They have the right to self-determination. I won't oppose it. I'll work with them, too. Um, I don't know that that's happening or not, but uh, there has been rumor of that. Um, the point of this is, um, if we're going to operate outside the bylaw, we need to have a conversation about how these folks, how our crews exist as employees under the framework of Deerfield bylaw. So uh, I know that Casey and I have had some discussion about this. I'm sure you've been included into this uh, at some level. Ultimately. Um, what I would like to see is uh, they're either going to form a collective bargaining agreement, uh, they're going to form a labor organization, or uh, we need to create something that is outside or within, but specific, within the personnel bylaw about South County employees. Mm -hmm. um, whatever yeah, we that is. We, we need to revise the bylaws across the board because it doesn't give any flexibility. And so some of these things need to be, some of the things in a bylaw need to be taken outside and put into a policy that you can adapt as time goes on. And we're just struggling with getting the bylaws removed. We, <clears throat> the boat club that I belong to, has got a set of bylaws, and then they've got a handbook. Right. So the handbook can be adjusted and changed. Okay. Right. Without by membership at a single at a meeting by a simple vote, whereas bylaws right. need to be posted twice, probably at town meeting for town purposes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the legislature legislature has to approve the change. So it's we're, really we're, yeah, we're um, there is something on our warrant this time. Um, we need to check it. That what you want to do is in line with what we're having on our warrant. Yeah. So let's have some talks about that. Uh, wow. Ideally, what I would do is I would make them 36-hour employees without a loss in pay. Um, um, what, what we have to do is you have to sort this out tomorrow, Josh, because tomorrow is the last day of our warrant. So <laughs> I you, appreciate the notice. Uh, <laughs> it has to, be, has to be done, you know, before our town meeting, a month yeah. before our town meeting. So, I'll talk to um, uh, talk to Casey tomorrow morning because I think what we're doing will allow that. Okay. You just have to check and make sure the wording is correct. Okay. I will do that. Thank you. Do does do the labor laws in the Commonwealth allow for instead of a forty hour a week, eighty hour over two week, and then you could have people do their three twelves each week and then at some point in there, one eight hour shift, or is that pretty? It's more? unnecessary. The, uh, the way that the state, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, um, but the last I look is the state does not define a full time employee by number of hours. So we can essentially say you're full time at any number of hours, right? It's, it's our prerogative whether or not we consider them full time. Well, so anything over two, 20 tw hours. Over 20, right. but that, but less than 40, that's, you know. Yeah. Now, why I like 36 hours is, you know, scheduling 40-hour uh, work weeks into a seven-day period is challenging when you're talking about maintaining 24-hour coverage, right? So it's just a lot easier if I can schedule people for three 12-hour shifts. That's a juicy job, right? Who, who wouldn't want to work a three-day-a-week job? You, you get all of your hours out of the way. Now, if we do have to hold somebody over, if I do need to recall somebody in, if I do need, if somebody gets a late call and they bring somebody down to Springfield, that first four hours, they're still on straight time, and that's great. 
but on top of that, if we do this without loss of pay, because I don't want to pay cut anybody, um, you know, this leaves us in a great position because we're going to get the majority of that, that extra time. We don't have to pay it out as overtime. But if somebody does take an extra 12-hour shift and work that fourth, that fourth day, eight hours of that time is now at an increased overtime rate. So they stand to do well from it. Now, we do very little overtime here at all. Uh, I haven't really made overtime widely available. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't have a problem with overtime per se. It's an essential component of maintaining staffing and running the operation. I mean, any public safety uh, organization, you're going to run into overtime. Um, but we do really well with it. In fact, um, during the entire month of March, we've awarded 35 hours of overtime as of today, which is only 0.5% of our operational hours. That's splendid. I've, right. I've noticed the change. Yeah, it's splendid, right? So uh, I don't award overtime to cover that impact shift. So if we've got one person in here to work it and they don't have a partner, I'm gonna open it up, we're gonna send a page out to our per diem employees, open shift, come work it please. And if nobody bites and they don't, uh, I'm paying that person to sit here with no partner, with no ability to go to a two minutes call. Now, I'm not gonna take their hours away, so I might find tasks for them, but we're not getting, well, we're not getting out of them what we're paying them for. So I'd like to revise this. And if I can do this three by 30, three by 12 matrix, um, I can guarantee staffing on A1 24 seven and with per diem utilization, we can keep the impact shift A2 up Monday through Friday, 12 hours a day, no problem. If we get to the point in the upcoming year, two years, three years from now, to where we're doing enough mutual aid to where it's reasonable, we could look to, using that scheduling matrix, look to hire an additional two full-time paramedics. And if that happens, we can guarantee full-time coverage. That's outstanding. <coughs> we're not there yet. I'm not asking for that, I'm not even, I'm just bringing it up as there's potential to go either way with this. So that's why I like this, this schedule matrix a lot. So, so while we're talking about the budget, I just wanted to ask a general question. How do all of your towns, other select board members, how they reacted to the budget? Huh. And what have you been hearing from your residents? We got an email today from somebody saying, you know, I don't want to, Dan Dennehy, I don't know what Dan Dennehy is. is. And crazy, crazy boots. Uh, it, yeah. He, yeah. But I'm just curious. <laughs> it's, a, it's a large, it's a large percentage increase that we're, even at the reduced rate that we've reached, Yeah, it's a big, big nut for people to swallow. Well, he brings up questions to get people thinking. Yeah. So, you know, generally, and sometimes he. Gadfly. Yeah. I, I can only Some, speak yeah. to. Um, sometimes he just so brings things I've up only, to stir the pot. Mm -hmm. I've only sat in front of two uh, finance committees. Uh, Deerfield um, had some really uh, cogent questions, and uh, it was it was a fine meeting. Um, ultimately, there was unanimous vote to uh, support as uh, presented. Uh, that was great. Sunderland, um, I think the FinCom meeting in Sunderland was exceedingly harsh um, and um, I've had the opportunity to chat with Jeff on a couple of occasions since then and I think it was really helpful so Casey and I went and sat down with him and I think once Jeff was able to kind of hear my perspective and see where I'm coming from with this um, you know most of this boils down to the fact that there were no retained earnings put back into the organization last fiscal year right so that's got to come from somewhere right and you know I can't not buy the stretcher um, you know that car is falling apart 
um, we've got step increases and 2% cola increases and you know you've got me and you know it just gets more expensive medical supplies are more expensive mm -hmm. I ask for uh, an increase in that so you know we're not you know uh, we're not trying to nickel and dime this is how much it's going to cost to run this organization and this is bare bones right? now, did Deerfield yeah. see this budget or the first the one? previous one so okay. this one is even reduced from what yeah. Deerfield right. FinCon um, but what what I voted in favor of. what you need to understand is we make these determinations subject to coming back to revisit them and we tell everybody who comes to the FinCon this is what we're saying today we might not say the same thing two weeks from now when we look at our finances as a global are you going to tell so, me something different in a couple of weeks? No, I'm not. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually here to say that I really yeah. support and think you're really bringing good plans to this. You know, this is the, the most thought that I've seen in some time from the director. So I really think this intercept vehicle is a great idea. Going electric is a great idea. Um, all the steps that you're thinking about looking at the scheduling. I think when we spoke, when you first came on, I said, I really am interested in your perspective on scheduling here because I'm not sure, you know, you, you get into patterns and that's what, how your life is and it all looks normal to you, but bringing someone in from outside, they look at it and say, well, this might have worked at one time, but maybe it doesn't work so well now. So I'm not hearing anything that you've said that I object to. I'm just saying that I was interested to get a perspective on what the other towns are thinking. Because yeah. well, be mm -hmm. Waitley yeah. <laughs> hasn't met. Yet, yeah. then I have no idea. <laughs> so, 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 Chief, one of the things there's there's a member at this table that's probably sitting to your immediate right that has been saying for many years that we haven't been we have been be giving we have not been giving our town members accurate costs on it, what it is to run the EMS service because we have been in some people's opinion, been over-utilizing retained earnings. Mm -hmm. And so that person may be smirking now, <laughs> but but it, it has been a concern. And, and so the budgets have been reduced by the use of retained earnings. And I don't know necessarily if that was really the intent of the retained earnings from the beginning. But so, so, I think it's uh, right now it's a um, what we're seeing now is a more accurate portrayal of the cost of providing the EMS service. You can thank my predecessor for that. Uh, for right, uh, and I don't, and that's not a bad thing. No, it, it's not because, it, and, and again, we can get more accurate numbers, and after a time, they'll become more stable numbers as well, especially with your plan on doing additional runs outside of, what, outside of what, the district. What really happened here? For our, I, I disagree in a way that retained earnings should, in my mind, retained earnings should be used to decrease the assessments because we have a conservative a revenue Correct. formula that I feel is we should keep. And, and because of that, we didn't get in trouble <coughs> during COVID when all of a sudden our you know, runs ran out. Yes, we didn't generate the extra revenue that would go into the retained earnings, but yet we were able to cover our bills for those years. Mm -hmm. What happened for our, where we don't have the retained earnings right now to offset this year is because we've been in business now successfully for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about equipment replacement. You know, But the retained earning, you, the, the, the which, conversely, the retained earning should be there to pay for that equipment, not to offset the budget. So uh, if, if I can- Budgets are, budgets are reoccurring expenses that are happening our, every year. But, but we decided to go forward with the ambulance, even though it, that we had a huge jump in costs, mm -hmm. and then we've are we are replacing equipment. So i what I'm saying is we have been wise in setting aside money for capital replacement, but the cost of capital replacement has been tremendously. It I mean we underestimated, and so yes. So this I, is an adjustment budget, basically. Yes. 
sure. it's bringing us back yeah. into more balance. Right. And <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be a good way to prove, to approve the plan that intercepts are going to be a part of this, to, you know, and, uh, right. and rescheduling right. is going to be a part of it. And For sure. Let me uh, keep moving <coughs> on my report because um, I'm, I'm far behind here, and I don't want to keep you here. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah Chief, you're, you're coming up to the hour. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just one thing, if I could. As you're talking with your staff in the meeting, um, I know you mentioned that there were rumors floating around about organization. The staff can certainly do what they like. Just if we could let the staff know mm -hmm. that we are looking at town bylaws and looking to do what we can to make the adjustments necessary, not that they feel that they need to organize to force us to do that. We do want to work with the staff. We've appreci we appreciate everything that they've done to date. We appreciate the quality of care, and we don't want them to feel like now that there's somebody new sitting in the chief seat, the whole world is going to change. This is just kind of an evolution. Of well, I mean, to some extent, um, people are going to do that anyway. Right? Sure. I mean, that's... But I, that's I don't want good. people to think that they're not going to be heard. Yeah. Uh, no, they're, I, I hope they don't. In fact, I, I think, you know, my experience working uh, and communicating with everybody here has just been outstanding. Okay. I mean, so, but I, most certainly. Okay, I appreciate that. But we've had, we've had, pro or I've had problems with 24 hour shifts for a long time. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, I'm you glad that that's getting addressed because I don't really feel like that, you know, we don't do a lot of calls, again, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you've been somewhere for 24 hours, you've had no break. Oh, it's you it's a long shift. Fatigued. Yeah. Especially they, if you're doing a lot of runs. I think yeah, the worst right. part or of this, too, is right. whether you're doing 20 calls or whether you're doing three. The point is, is if it's 10, 11 o'clock at night and I decide that I'm going to go take my shoes off and lay down and close my eyes and then a tone goes off at 2 in the morning, I'm interrupting a deep sleep cycle and I am not performing at a level of safety. <laughs> See, that so, <laughs> you know, I'm, I've done it for years and, you know, uh, it's nice to work the day less a week, no denying that, mm -hmm. but come on. I mean, so, you know, just to put this in context, you know, I have a, a background in um, uh, uh, doing flight paramedic, and, you know, you turn into a pumpkin at 14 hours. Um, that's just the end of it. Uh, you're, you're certainly not working 24-hour uh, shifts. So, uh, right, you but know. you look at even DOT and stuff, you can't drive after, you can work after, uh, mm -hmm. 13 hours, but you can't drive after, you know, this isn't a new thought that a 24 hour right. shift is too much. And even time. in our industry within EMS, I mean, th this is an ongoing discussion and the way, the reason that a lot of departments like to staff 24s is because they can have fewer full-time employees. It's just that easy. And if you're operating a fire department that has to buy several multi-million dollar pieces of apparatus and you need to outfit every single person with five or six thousand dollars in turnout gear and you need to, yeah, the fewer people, the better. I get that. Um, plus, there's a whole tradition, there's a whole, I'm not even going to go there, but I think when we're just talking about common sense and safety, there's two things that I tell people that I care about. Uh, I care about crew safety and I care about patient advocacy. If you follow those two things, if you keep you and your partner safe and you do everything in your power to advocate for that patient, we're never going to have a problem, ever, right? Um, this fits into that first thing, so I, I'm really supportive of this, but I know people are going to be on it. Um, in administration, um, Chris Nolan with Deerfield is working with Comcast to get our building here added to the municipal contract for service to get rid of our ridiculous uh, internet and cable bill, which is over the top. Now, they presented us with a couple of options. The first one is Comcast will give us free internet and cable, no cost. It is a greatly reduced service. Now, I just want to put it out there that what we have right now is over the top. We probably have the finest internet service in Western Mass. It's unbelievable, and it is it far exceeds our requirements. So, uh, I'm not 
at all uh, at odds with decreasing the level of service that we receive. However, I needed to take care of what we needed to take care of. So we're going to look at that. I'm absolutely willing to pay for service. I'm not willing to pay this. Uh, this is over the top. So that is an ongoing thing. We can either get added to that municipal agreement, um, and because this is not considered a town building under that Comcast agreement. So it's, we're either going to do that, or we're going to sidestep that and say, no, we're an emergency municipal public safety organization. Right. So we're looking at it regardless. I'm hopeful that in the next couple, few months, we can put this to bed and be done with it. As far as the budget is concerned, I don't know what it's going to look like. So I've left the line item as it was. So but the potentially that's a $7,500 reduction. Potentially. Yeah. I would, I would hope. Potentially. Yeah. I would hope that it gets Big to potentially. Um, all right, so that's one thing. Uh, we, I sent you emails, we discussed the full set overtime calculation um, and uh, that bit of debacle. So that has, the full set overtime calculation has been added to our payroll forms that the employees do um, each payroll period. Um, on top of that, uh, so moving forward, we're in a good position to actually pay people uh, in line with what um, the law says we have to. Um, that part includes shift differentials after 40 hours actually worked within the overtime calculation. That's part of the FLSA, we have to do it. Um, so uh, the payroll forms have been adjusted. The second part of that is we're completing a two-year look back, thank you Sarah uh, in Deerfield for uh, this monumental task, um, to see have we underpaid anybody over this two-year period, the two-year period also being defined by FELSA. So um, they have, will get paid out in this week's paycheck, I believe it comes out tomorrow, um, for fiscal year 24 look backs. Um, that total amount for all employees only totaled $399.12. So we're not talking enormous sums of money. It's not going to put us in arrears. Um, but it's important that we make people whole. That includes former employees over the time period uh, who are uh, entitled to it. No, so make, make it right, Chief. We'll make it right. Make it right. So that's what and, and, and the other thing about the Comcast thing, not that I was on the original negotiating team, with Comcast, I was. This is a Deerfield building filled with Deerfield employees. Yes, it's just not on that paper. That's it. And, and but there, there's there's mechanisms to add buildings. Absolutely. Yes. So and I'm and Carolyn, I'm sure Casey knows that. So and again, but it and when we negotiated, by the way, which was eleven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, my, oh, my wife said, where have you been? I said, I've been at a meeting. There's no meetings that last 11 o'clock. Yeah, when you deal with Comcast, they last. You know. <laughs> but I think, I think Carolyn, we should be able to take care of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, this is going to be eliminated. Don't worry. Yeah. This, it's, it's just, it's, it's absurd. A, it's a rip off. So what we're uh, paying for. Um, you'll fix it. Yes. You'll fix it. Yeah. What, what we're paying for with this is, you know, just this ridiculous bandwidth and backups and I mean it is just over the top. It's great if like you're into that kind of stuff. I just need to be able to use my browser and like we really don't need anything that robust. So does this mean we're not going to be mining Bitcoin in the back closet? And that was my plan to bring the assessments down. It was my Bitcoin farm. So, um, all right. Um, I have. We're going to ask here. Um, the only other thing I. Um, <coughs> Pat, did you have um, Pat looking yeah. into um, the phone system? To so we're pricing that right now. I've looked at switching vendors, and I'm getting a quote that's really comparable to what we have right now. And then uh, I was going to ask Pat if we could maybe switch to the townwide system 
okay. um, and see what that looks like. Because um, Pat, Pat wanted to do that, and she said there was going to be savings. She wanted to do that last year. Okay. And I, I believe that there will be some savings on that. You know, not tremendous amount, but could be 50% of what we're paying. Every little bit helps. That would be yeah. useful. Landline telephones are not what they used to be, so. Right. Sure. Right. Um, I have submitted our ambulance service license renewal with OEMS uh, that's paid, you know, check cut application submitted. So um, I won't hear back from them for a little bit, but we should expect that, you know, they'll come around for our annual inspection uh, closer to the uh, end of the fourth quarter. I've also renewed our uh, controlled substance registration, so that's all set. Um, we do have to uh, apply for a um, clinical laboratory waiver from uh, CMS. Uh, this is something the service hasn't had that we really should have. Um, it's basically what allows us to do um, um, minimally invasive um, diagnostic evaluations um, like blood glucose and things like that, and we don't have it, so we have to do that. Um, so I'll be doing that over uh, in the near future. Um, and then moving on, uh, just a couple program updates. Uh, we've been talking with Treehouse Brewing. Um, they want to increase their venue capacity for certain events. So this is like concerts and races and all kinds of things like that. Um, my focus on this, uh, so they've invited every, you know, uh, concerned town department to <clears throat> go talk with them about their action plan and all of that. My concern is, of course, all about EMS, um, and I just strongly feel that if they're going to do events uh, above a certain capacity, that they should uh, staff um, some of our crew there. And the reason for that is they're you know, likely to need us, and I don't want the rest of our population to suffer for that, right? So that just makes good sense. And I think if they're just being good hosts and good stewards, they're gonna want to do that. They've not been unreasonable with me. Um, so uh, that's ongoing. Um, let's see, the Lions Club in Deerfield, woohoo. Uh, I emailed you about this. They've offered us a $4,500 donation. Uh, which is really splendid. Uh, so I'm super thankful. Um, and we'll do some type of, you know, social media and public uh, gratitude uh, for that. But what I'd like to do is use that money to replace our first in bags on our ambulances and the uh, intercept vehicle, um, which currently has no equipment. Uh, so that's outstanding um, because that's what it's going to cost. I may actually need to dip into some of our other uh, donated funds. Um, I was just going to say, I think you have, I can tell you how much you have. It's roughly 4000 Something like that. Um, but uh, I will potentially need to dip into that as well. Um, but we'll get all new first in equipment, and that's splendid. They're long overdue. The crews really do need that. So. And that's great because it doesn't come out of our budget. Right. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, before we move on from the budget line, I mean, if you get the um, uh, phone and internet reduced, make sure you get that out to the towns, um, you know, that reduction to the towns. Um, I'm not clear. Um, if you get that reduced, you want to put it in the Oh, in the budget. budget. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So that the town meeting were voting the correct budget. Uh, that's the only thing. That becomes part of your reduction when you get the second request to come for finance. There you go. Yeah. So uh, it is a priority. Yeah. yeah you just you just want to. Um, uh, oh, you're, you're the, the detail. Um, the detail fund is zero. We must have been made a payment of $600 now. Um, I don't even see the donation fund. The donation fund has $4,634.13. Perfect. So, so as I, of February. I think we're going to probably use that to <coughs> do 
addition to that 4,500, but that's going to get us what we need. So yep. big difference. All right, um, moving right along. Um, I've started a weekly training class, uh, kind of. Uh, so this is a moderated peer chart review with everybody. We have standing meetings at 10 a.m. every Tuesday. It runs until noon. Uh, they're awarded two hours of OEMS approved continuing education credit every week for it. That satisfies not only the M and M program requirement, but also satisfies. Um, state and local component for their recertification. So, uh, you know, they're going to get hundreds of hours of education annually out of this. It can't all be awarded um, for their research, but what it is is kind of one of the cornerstones of our uh, quality improvement um, process within the department. So it's something new that we're doing here. It's been really well received, and it's just fantastic. So. Um, you know, next time you're chatting with uh, one of the crews, you know, ask them how it's going, and uh, I'm interested to hear um, that indirect feedback. That would be helpful for me. Um, and then lastly, current projects that I'm working on. Um, so we talked about the CMS CLIA, we talked about station alerting a little bit, replacement vehicle. I'm gonna devote some time. Uh, I've been here long enough now that I'm ready to get out of the office and away from the computer a little bit. So I'm gonna devote some time now um, to actually third writing on the ambulance and um, you know get a better sense of how folks work here. And on top of that, um, you know, I'll be able to obtain my own authorization to work here so that you know need be I can work on the ambulance, which as of today I cannot do here. So that needs to happen. So that's going to happen over the next few weeks. I'm going to transition our CPAP to BiPAP. Uh, it's just a clinical change that we're making in our equipment. We'll be training on it. Uh, it's not going to cost us much in the way of anything. It's just uh, a change. We'll be completing surgical airway training and adding that uh, to our um, capability uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, it's really fun. We'll take some pictures, but uh, basically we cut apart, you know, animal necks that we get from a butcher, and we practice on them. And um, this is so that we can perform surgical airway interventions when necessary. It's an uncommon procedure, but it's an essential one to have. But currently, they don't. We started a vaccine storage program, uh, or renewed the vaccine storage program, I should say, with the public health nurse. We've had this vaccine in fridge in the, uh, in the garage space here for some time, so we're getting that up and running again. Um, one of my um, kind of mid-moderate uh, term uh, projects is to gain an authorization for community EMS and that will include community vaccinations as part of our service. So this is a really outstanding opportunity. I was pumped when I saw that we have a vaccine fridge sitting in here, even though it's not ours. That's great because that's a... It is ours. It's South County EDS. Well, right, but it's not ours, right? But yeah. it's... Um, but we yes, got it through it a grant that is available to our emergency dispensing site, which is the Fort Towns. It's amazing. So I'm thrilled. Um, so I'll be hopefully doing some more work with uh, public health um, over the next probably like six, nine, 12 months to get that off the ground. Um, maybe even I, as soon I just as want to say I am so thankful because that has been one of my big things was to get the ability to do vaccine management. It's huge, right? So, so if we could do you. something by next flu season, that would be outstanding. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we'll make that target. If not, we'll certainly be ready for the one we're, after that. We're almost there. We're, it won't take long. Yeah. Um, and then, what else? Um, that was a real big book of book for me. It's, it's, yeah, it's this an important huge. thing. So, uh, two big ones that I won't go into huge depth here, but I would like to start the process of assessing our organization for uh, accreditation um, uh, with the Commission of Ambulance Services. Um, 
this is really important as we look to it. The, the idea with accreditation here is one, it's a beautiful roadmap of how to operate a very high quality and robust EMS program. But the other thing is it, it lets us look at benchmarks because right now what we can say about our program is we think we're really great, right? But are we? Uh, well, we think so. And there's a lot of things that we know we do well, but what are we not doing so well? So I would like to begin this process of department self-evaluation, and I would like to look over the next few years to make improvements. Most of it has to do with policy, uh, reporting, things like that. It's all work for me. Um, the crews are gonna have to do some light reading, um, but really it's, it's a project for me. Um, and uh, that's something I would like to do. It costs money, so I would like to add that money into, um, I would like to make a plan for that, um, but very few uh, ground ambulance services in the United States are actually accredited. Um, I would like to be one of them. Um, it's a wonderful standard to strive towards. Uh, I have worked for an accredited agency before and the difference is palpable. Sure, because you have everything, everything has an SOP, right? And, uh, and you're, everything, you have, the, you have your procedures, you have a standard way to do things. It's great. And you can't, and you can't technically, theoretically, you don't lose it. You don't lose that ability because it's all written down, just like police departments being accredited. <coughs> very difficult, <coughs> but very meaningful if, if attained. Hugely. So I want to strive for that. It is not a short-term goal. Uh, no, it's it's a five process. years. It's, we're talking, yeah, I'm looking at three to five years. Sure. Um, I was going to say three probably. probably. And it's going to be a $10,000 thing every five years is what it's going to come down to. So I want to start saving for that. With retained the earnings. Retained, retained earnings, <laughs> right? And then lastly. Um, well, well, actually, in my opinion, that would be a retained earnings thing. Because that because that would not be that would not be a reoccurring expense. It's a reoccurring for that first five years or three. But after that it's not a reoccurring expense. So absolutely. So um, last thing is supervisory standards and training quality metrics. Um, so what I want to do is in this budget that you have in front of you, I've eliminated the deputy chief position from it. I'm not saying I don't want a deputy chief. I sure do, especially as we look to accreditation and we look to uh, actually qualifying um, our staff through, uh, be it certification or through training. Um, I'm going to need additional support. This is too much work for one person, but we'll get there. Um, I will look to next fiscal year to have more discussion of filling a deputy chief position because it is a additional full-time employee above what we have now. So I'll table that one for now. I've also reduced two supervisor positions from the budget that you see in front of you. So the idea here is I still want to promote two people to supervisory positions so that we can focus on at least having supervision overnights and weekends. Two people is not going to be enough to achieve that. Uh, the concern, and this was brought up at Sunderland FinCom, uh, really I believe we need four supervisors on staff. And the concern at FinCom and Sunderland was, and I totally understand it, is you have 10 full-time road medics and you want to promote four of them. It, you know, and you've got a full-time chief and you want a deputy chief. It seems like the most top-heavy organization in the world, but it's not because we don't have 10 people. Um, we've got 19 people, and the way that we talk about scheduling, I'm looking to put one of them on at all times, not four of them. So basically, you come to work. There's four people at work on a given day. One of them should be a supervisor, right? That just makes good sense to me. Um, and I would like to get to the point where that happens, whether I'm in the building or not. But for now, we can at least focus on weekends and overnights. You, you, you said something important, though. You just said something important. I say important. a lot of important. 
Well, <laughs> on, on this topic, you, you said there's four people in the building, there's one supervisor. That person's still working. Correct. It's, it's not like that person would be sitting in an office. Correct. So I think that's a... It, it's no different than having a sergeant, sergeant on the police, police department. department. But our, exactly at least in Sunderland, our sergeants run a patrol. That's correct. So that's the idea. The, I would model it uh, not precisely after police. It'd be more, uh, it'd be its own model. So what I'd like to do is I kind of like the lieutenant nomenclature. Um, and then if we ever do expand, we can look to uh, other options. But I like that concept because um, it lets that person run a ship, right? They're responsible for their schedule. They're responsible for calls. They're responsible for um, making sure checklists are performed. They're responsible for making sure that people do the decks. Now, I don't worry about those things not getting done, I'm not suggesting no. Our crews are incredible. But I think ultimately we need to, on paper, have that responsibility lie with somebody. That trail needs to exist, right? Especially when we talk accreditation. Right? But, I, but I also think by doing with two, going to two right now, it'd be hard for you to make it four all at once. I know, maybe, but so, but by mentoring by mentoring two now all of a sudden you 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 increase your and which I think has been sorely missing for a long time that second level that 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 building up that building up the responsibility, but now you have you have help mentor you have help mentoring and you can also mentor the mentors and sure. so I, I I think that's a wise decision chief good job. So that's Good the job. plan, um, and as far as the quality metrics and the training of that, um, I want them to not necessarily receive certification, but I want them to follow the metrics of the uh, National uh, EMS Managers Association. Um, there's a whole bunch of literature and process involved with that. Um, paying the money for that credentialing doesn't really buy us anything um, because we can do it uh, homegrown. Um, so to me it makes sense, but I like following the standard. So that's where that's going to come from. So just a quick question on that. When you actually go for accreditation, will it make a difference whether those people have actually officially no. done it versus not? No, I mean, I think okay. I, I think as long as we, it's, no, it's a great question. I think as long as we can show that we have followed a process, right? Yeah. Um, this is what it entailed and this was, um, I think that's going to okay. exceed what they're used to. Yeah, no, I'm just okay. thinking if it if that will make a difference with accreditation, mm -hmm. probably it's a, you know, bite the bullet and start doing the official program versus, yeah. sure. but if it doesn't yeah. make a difference? I think it's maybe sense. a good long-term goal, um, more so with field training officers than even with supervisors, um, because there's a lot of language out there about what a field training officer should be doing and best practices for that. Um, you know, uh, we're certainly not, you know, we don't have anything near that robust here. We will, but um, yeah, that's it. That's all I have for my report. Uh, I'm sorry that took an hour and a half. I won't do that next time, but so, I'm new to this. So, so um, bless you. One, one thing I'd like to add bless um, you. is that I'd, I'd like to thank Chief for his email that he sent out earlier this week. I took that took courage to speak of that. Um, it's not an easy thing to th speak about, and I, and I hope it's conveyed to 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 your department as well, because those, those are those are it's a critical, a very critical thing, and like you said, it, it wasn't seen, um, and I I I, I do think. It, <coughs> Just I've, I've known three in a very recent time also. So it's been around me as well. Um, and I, I think I think that by your courage putting it out there, because it's very easy to put under, you know, work very tough in this profession that, that you chose. But to put that out there is a very strong, strong statement to your people that you care about. Thank you. I appreciate it. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, it's super important. Absolutely. And I mean it. Uh, anybody that needs those resources, they'll get them. Thank you. Story. So. And, and, and you have 100% support, 120%, 30% of this board. And don't, don't even, and, 
And if you have a if you have a particularly nasty run, or your crew does, do not think about services. We want to make sure our folks are well right. taken care of, so that they can continue to take care of all of us. Absolutely. We feel very strongly about that. Absolutely. <coughs> all right. Uh, what's next? Any other discussion? Um, Motion. Next Hold week. on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the new business overtime policy you spoke about. Briefly, I want to add one more thing about overtime policy. Um, currently, um, we don't have language in our policies and procedures, um, which will obviously over the next couple of years be going uh, through major look, uh, looks and revisions. Uh, all of those will come to you, of course. But currently in the language, there's nothing about how overtime is awarded as far as when. So the practice has been to award it based on seniority and last overtime awarded, and that's fair and that makes sense. However, when do we award it out? What I've taken to doing is saying two days for this is, so we're only awarding overtime for openings on a1, primary ambulance. And I'm gonna try and fill it with per diems first. But if we get a couple days out, and we've known about it for weeks, and we've been paging it and paging it, and I don't get any takers, well then, I have no choice but to award overtime. I cannot let that shift go unfilled. So, um, I wanted your input on when you think it is reasonable. Uh, I can look at other departments' SOPs. I can look at collective bargaining agreements from uh, around the industry. Um, but if anybody has uh, any specific things in mind, um, you know, I'm not sold on this two-day standard. I think that maybe even awarding it prior to that, uh, further out, is very reasonable. Because I'd want to know. Right, I, I right. want to schedule yeah. my life at least a week in advance. Mm -hmm. right? So an equalized overtime doesn't work versus doing it by seniority? Explain. So equalized overtime is the person with the least overtime gets the first offer. Mm -hmm. so that's Yeah, so that's what we do. Oh, right. okay. Well, you were saying by seniority. So I'm thinking, so... It starts by seniority and then after, so for the sake of conversation, yeah. Let's say I'm the most senior person, yeah. and I get an overtime shift, and then Chief, we'll use Chief because he's here, Chief puts in for a shift, and I put in for a shift. Chief hasn't worked it, so then it would go to him. Okay, but, so... That's equalized. So it's, it's it goes... Okay. So so he would get the first, if he works it, the next round, so he, they, he would, he'd he be skipped the next round, and the next senior person would yeah, be... Yeah, no, that's still well, not... I, I go to the bottom. So. Right. Right, but that's still not equalized, because if the Chief... He's the second. If he refuses 10 overtime shifts in a row, his overtime number is zero, right? He's got zero overtime. The person with the least amount of overtime is the first person you call. Tim yeah. would be at the bottom of the list because he's got 100 hours of overtime. I see. Yeah, but if you refuse, if you refuse overtime, if you refuse the overtime, it's considered like you worked it. That's fair overtime. So again, you know, I, I think there's just different ways to look at yeah. overtime. An equalized mm -hmm. policy where you have shifts that people may have to refuse mm -hmm. because it turns it into a 36 hour shift for them, right? So they would be justifiable to refuse that overtime. You wouldn't want them working that overtime. Mm -hmm. So if that happens just by coincidence three or four times to this same guy, he he's going to be real low on overtime hours. So he should be getting the first option. Or you know, again, it's just a different way to look at it. I'm sure. Then also, it, it means that if only your senior people get the overtime, it's going to be the most expensive overtime you can have because the least the, the least senior person presumably has a different pay scale or I don't know in here right but I'm just thinking yeah. of that person who it just yeah, by well, chance keeps falling that well, overtime chief, shift I, so I would chief I, I'd give personally I'd give chief the first pass at it because I've been negotiating 
overtime policies, I think it's easy for him to think, oh, shape because I don't want to do another one. But I think it's the most so, difficult thing uh, it is. What, we need to bring him something. Bring what something. we need to discuss about this is the awarding of it, um, because we have practice, but we don't have language. So there should be language. Um, this should be written in stone. Yeah. Uh, we also need to address if there is an opening, uh, let's say that Tim is working overnight and I'm supposed to relieve him in the morning, but I get sick and I can't make it into my shift. How are we going to fill that shift? Mandated. I can mandate him to stay. We don't have language about that and we need to. So we need to look at that. You don't have the language on that? We don't. And we also don't have any... Um, what were you thinking? About, um, I didn't have the issue, thank God. <laughs> about forced overtime, right? Uh, and nobody wants to be told, hey, stop what you're doing and come to work. Um, but that is a reality because I can only reasonably hold somebody over for so long. Mm -hmm. You know, at a point, I have to get somebody else in. That's that's tough. It's nobody likes it, but you know you can make it juicy with pay incentives and things like that. It's pretty typical in this industry that if you're going to be forced in, it's double time, things like that. So, I mean, we can have those discussions, and these instances are going to be exceedingly rare. I don't anticipate them happening, but I think we need to address them in language. So, what I'd like to do is look at a bunch of examples uh, from some of my other friends in different departments. I want to see what they do. Uh, I want to look at their CBAs, I want to look at their department policies, and I want to look at national trends. And let's come up with the best practice. I'll present options to you, probably by email, and we can um, discuss that at our next meeting. Yeah, cool. uh, because it will be a policy change. So, yep, does that fine. seem reasonable? Yeah, you can just draft some language and then we'll look at it. You got it. And I'm okay if you yeah. discuss I want to discuss with the employees in the staff meeting, lay out some options and hear their feedback. To be sure. Okay. And I struggle with the forest, especially somebody who's got children and yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I can't go pick my kid up from daycare, so you're gonna let social no, services come take him because you're forced me into overtime. Yeah. But <laughs> the issue that I have, you is, know, if, if I, I worry on that because no. that I get you. Mm -hmm. The issue that I had, particularly twice when I was doing this, was. There was two days where I couldn't get anyone to work, and there was one of those days where I was in like northern Maine or something, so I couldn't get in. So the ambulance needs to respond. Right. Like we don't want right. to say we couldn't get anyone in, we need mutual aid, but we have no policy right now that forced like Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it even if it's for four hours, I could stretch that out for four hours because most people aren't checking their email at three o'clock in the morning when right. if chief calls out at three AM, I'm not like laying in bed like, oh sweet, there's something <coughs> checked. I'm looking at it at seven thirty, eight o'clock when right. I get up. And that's the issue. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and like I said, I yeah, just you know, Sundays. we've just got a different world too yeah. where I worry about families or people taking yeah. care of adult you know, mm -hmm. no, I get it. Care it's, care. it is a very difficult it's, thing it's to brush. It, it, it really is. But you know, ultimately, <coughs> this is a down. government public okay. safety Again, agency. Again, I went through this. You know, have to spend. So, that's yeah. right. So, uh, you know, okay, <coughs> uniforms really quickly. I'm going to defer till next time. Um, capital planning. Um, we don't have a capital plan that's going to change too, so I'm going to start drafting stuff. What I'm going to start by doing is taking inventory of capital assets. Um, we'll have a discussion about a replacement schedule uh, based off of useful life expectancy um, and anticipated needs. I'm going to look at uh, equipment, I'm going to um, look at vehicles, and I'm going to look at more intangible assets that we know are very expensive that require periodic maintenance. So we'll look at all of those and uh, I think that we, just as we deliver retained earnings to offset the assessments, we need to save money to pay for our expensive things. Because right now, if I need a new ambulance, Tomorrow, I'm out of luck. If 
if I need a new monitor, if I need a new, I'm completely out of luck. We just, we need to plan for this. So um, that's another project just to, it's on the front burner and, um, you know, uh, I'll work with you heavily on this. Deerfield, Deerfield's, uh, we want a five-year plan and is, is what we look at um, as the most immediate. But then we also have the 15-year. And that the reason why we have the 15-year is because there are just some expenses that you cannot afford in your five-year plan mm -hmm. and that you still have to pay, pay for you know, roads, other infrastructure stuff. But this this will allow you to look at our, when our roof needs to be replaced. You know, some of these things that, um, from a long-term view, there's not necessarily your responsibility, but you should incorporate it in to the plan because no one else is doing it. You know, people yeah, have to you, do it. You've got a lot of things that are on the 10 or 15 year life expectancy, and they should be on some sort of schedule. Right. 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 Now that we're replacing a lot of those things, right? We should be. But but even as we replace them, we need to know when we're going to replace them next. Right. When's the next time you need right. to replace right. the water heater, yes. or when's the next time the roof? South yeah. Deerfield Fire and, District and the stretcher has done a phenomenal yeah. job mm. going out with a long-term plan for all of the equipment. So, and my only other comment would be, as you build this, I think it needs to be built not only on a time frame, mm -hmm. but Life expectancy based on current call volume. Of course. Life expectancy based on if we hit 2,000 calls a year. Because I think part of the hang-up gets to be, Josh, you came to us back in 2024 <coughs> and you said this was going to last 10 years, and here we are at seven years, and you want it replaced. Why did we know about this? And mm -hmm. At least if you put it, if you can tie it to a, a call yeah. volume, <clears throat> hey, look, yeah. call volume has increased, so it's not 10 years now, it's seven But years. Also, also on the flip side of that, if we get the you know, replacement vehicle, that's going to take some wear and tear off of the ambulance. The, the interceptor. The, in, yeah. Right, right. Yes, but not as much as you'd think. Um, you know, we're just, you know, I will say we're not pounding out 20 calls a shift, you know, uh, through the city, like beaten ambulances, and we're only going to get two years out of it. So we're, we're in a good position with that. But I think, you know, that intercept vehicle probably will take a beating mm -hmm. for yep. sure. Yeah. Like, that's a good point. Um, the other thing I want to uh, talk about capital planning is my understanding is that we are funded as um, a. Um, Enterprise an fund. enterprise fund. You're independent. So no. technically, if we want to make capital purchases, I don't really, I need your approval as a board, but we don't have to go to any specific town's capital planning for approval or rely on that town for town meeting to approve it. You, you do. But we don't on, on this building. On the building, but not yeah, on our not capital equipment. Correct. And but the so, building is Deerfield. So it occurred to me as I'm sitting in capital planning last week or the week before, asking the town of Deerfield for authorization for these projects. I don't need to be here technically, because as long as I'm meeting DLS uh, obligations, um, if this board approves the spending. That enterprise fund is spent as if free cash. So if you if you have the monies, if you have the monies available and you're not borrowing. Correct. If you're borrowing, then That's you need the, the borrowing goes through the town. Correct. But you know, the 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 reason I bring this up is I'm just looking at it um, you know, yeah, I'm an employee of the town of Deerfield for sure, but my allegiance uh, as the chief of department is to the agency and all three communities. My concern about this, I'm sorry, Carolyn, uh, my, my concern about this is if Waitley and Sunderland really want us to do something, and they're like, yes, response vehicle, that's going to be a wonderful thing for our service that we pay for. And then Deerfield Town Meeting says, nope. Why is the town of Deerfield voting how Sunderland and Waitley can spend their money? And when because we're talking about the building, that be, makes sense. Because, because 
you're 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 on a path, um, but the path that we established when, when we established this was that we were all going to work together. Just so you see, Whiteley has two members on the board of oversight. Well, by the by their level of payment, it should be like three, two, one. But what what we what we had agreed was that we were going to, and and it was a leap of it was a leap of faith to begin with, is that all towns, although financial may have not the same commitment, we all make the same because if we had not bound together, we would not have formed our our organization. So it was more important that we treated that we treat each of the towns as equals, and that. Big big things were going to be done in unison, and that yeah. reinforces what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, well so I, you if you bring your budget to all of our town meetings and two town meetings say no, then it doesn't matter what Deerfield says. You know, you're not going to get what you want to do in your overall budget, even though you contain you control the money that you're talking about. But I'm saying, as an enterprise fund, it's not obligated to go to town meeting. I think it's more of a courtesy than which, an obligation. Which is fine if we want to do that, but it just occurred to me that like this is a lot of process and it's a lot of um, decision making that may not be equally represented. So I just wanted to bring this up. I'm not yeah. asking for change. No. I'm, I'm asking for observation. No, um, and, and actually I'm glad you do bring it up because you under hopefully you'll understand more more about us. Because um, our, our, our in, in, in a frontier regional, or the school committee was at one point kind of done that way. Everybody was equal, and then then we were told that we couldn't do that any longer because it violated some kind of law. So now there's equal one, one man, one vote, right? One person, one vote. So it, it ended up being different. What the idea of going through our capital process is, is that we had we are one of the first communities. I think we, I believe, we were the first one of the first communities that had a capital process. I, you know, um, started in the early 2000s, and I don't think there was other processes available. And and as a part of being Deerfield, being a fiscal agent. Then you you do the bylaws by the town of Deerfield. You do the you know capital process, the budget process. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't pay attention to Waitley and Sunderland, but the idea is that well, that's a, that can be debated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the pro, the, the, that we we're all process. laughing. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not well, looking to start a war. Yeah. Yeah. We had a process. <laughs> Happy to turn over all the insurance to anybody who wants to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Every, you know, I know anything, we all split it. Anything <laughs> over 10000 and it's non-recurring goes through the capital mm -hmm. process. And then because we vetted it, the, you know, the capital does look at it differently in the sense that, you know, what's the funding source? The funding source is your retained earnings. So nobody really questions it. Sure. And, and then it goes to the public hearing process and then it goes to town meeting. You are correct that probably you do not have to do it because of, you know, it is an enterprise fund. But the fact that you go through the process, then it is public. Everyone knows how you're spending the money. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, so it's more transparent. But um, I, I, I know as being on the capital committee right from the very beginning, the the funding source coming from the enterprise fund means it has less scrutiny than where do you get your funding? What's the funding source? And and it is usually uh, everything that is recommended by the boo does go through. I mean, there could be questions, and there are questions sometimes, but it is mostly run. Oh, the boo recommended this. This is what your thing is. Okay. Okay. The, why there's more controversy this year is because you know there was a huge increase but otherwise sure th so the, this level of scrutiny is a little bit different for the enterprise fund yeah. so i was just seeking clarification so it's essentially done for the sake of disclosure um and, and that's yeah. totally reasonable um but yeah i was confused about the process because uh i was just sitting there the other night thinking 
wait a minute, uh, this is an enterprise fund. And that's a beautiful thing. Like, I love being an enterprise <clears throat> fund. It's well, the, the accountants don't agree with you, but, <laughs> yeah, but you know, they don't like enterprise like funds. Some of the finance committee yeah, they don't, they don't like enterprise you know, funds. That would essentially I, I've been be, wondering about that for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but, no, it, it puts us in a position that gives us a lot of flexibility, uh, which is really nice, right? Um, well, that if you go back to our old minutes, you'll, you'll find out that we have purchased things with the Enterprise Fund outside of the, outside yeah. of the town meeting process. Gotcha. Yeah. So we have. We, we try to keep that committee because on town meeting floor people will ask has capital approved this has finance approved it the sure. fear becomes if you haven't done that somebody could raise a stink it didn't go through the right process blah 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 and then look to strike the budget <coughs> and them out or instead yeah. of buying the interceptor vehicle they'll want to apply it towards earnings to lower the tax rate or lower the assessment sure it's so, more of a transparency kind of yeah. thing. That makes sense. And it's a rubber stamp. <coughs> I'm not saying it is automatically, no. but just like our know, just like our ordering is an angel last year. Just like you came and made the right? argument, people mm -hmm. look at it and then scrutinize it, and it's like, oh, they're going to be paying for it out of retained earnings. They've already made that choice. It's fine. You know, and how you move <coughs> your earnings, that that's fine. You know, great. <laughs> yeah, and going that route five gives you goodwill and benefit of the doubt right. when you want to do something down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's just a mechanism that, that allows us to be pu become public. Because otherwise, you know, what we do here is not necessarily seeing the same thing. No, it's not. I, I sort of have it, I, I don't know exactly, um, if an enterprise fund can just say, this year I want 500000 from the town, you know, they can't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, because it's in the in the budget that we have to review and we all have to agree and accept, but yeah, capital expense with you, with money that the boo sort of has authority to control, mm -hmm. it, it's still in the context of the budget because it's an expense, but we have a defense for hey, this money is generated by the by the enterprise fund, and um, you know it, it's to help the enterprise fund operate and. Increase revenue, et cetera, and gives us a lot of cover to our our senior center says, well, we have more seniors coming, so therefore you should give us more money. Well, that's not necessarily Correct. your decision to make. <laughs> that's the decision of the town voters to make. <clears throat> so I don't know. It's an interesting, interesting issue. Just lighting a little fire. That's yeah, all. that's okay. It's always good. It's one that you should skip. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, is there anything I else? I promise <laughs> only to make you nervous on occasion. But, um, Fred, are you all set? I am all set. Other the meeting? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, what, what's our yeah. next meeting date, guys? How often do you regularly meet? Do we need to get together? When is Deerfield Finance going through round two? Um, my understanding is that sometime after next week, or next week, by next week, they're going to finish up most of the budgets by Monday, and then they're going to look for the gap, covering the gap. I but think that, that the last scheduled meeting I see is April 16, which doesn't mean that probably any changes would happen before then. But yeah, they have one on Tuesday the 9th and Tuesday the 16th. 16th. So Weekly FEMCOM is the 16th. Yeah. Um, hopefully by then we'll have sorted out like the cable and mm -hmm. the telephone. Mm -hmm. So that would be another change and that would be positive. Hopefully. Yeah. We want to shoot for like Wednesday the 17th. Um, we can't do Wednesday the 17th. Okay. Get a select board meeting. Yeah, we have a select board meeting. But we could do... Um, the 18th? The 18th. I can... The 18th is okay for me. It's okay. We have the info session about the town warrant. 
I think on the 18th. Well, we had either the 18th or the 22nd. What about the following week? 24th uh, or 25th. So Sunderland Town Meeting is the 26th. Okay. Um, we should we, we should, should really try to meet holiday. the oh the fifteenth is a holiday. Uh, what holiday? A holiday? Um, tax Patriots Day. Day. Patriots yeah, Day. Yeah, tax day. <laughs> uh, I mean it's oh it's a holiday. Crystal, um, what, when is town meeting? The twenty sixth. Twenty sixth for Sunday. Oh. On holidays. Okay, I didn't I didn't realize that. <laughs> Just so you know, Waitley actually moved ours back against June eighteenth, not fourth. Uh, what was that? I'm sorry. Uh, Waitley's town meeting will be June 18th. We could. Wow. Uh, I'm okay with Well, my only concern is going to the following week if there's any type of budgetary things that we need to talk about. It's going to be pushing right up against Sunderland's town meeting and then ours is that following Monday. Yeah. I I guess my question is. Or yours is, is the 29th? Yeah. 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 Um, I guess my only question is at, if Deerfield, and I apologize, Chris, I'm not oversighting what yeah. Sunderland or Waitley might do. I know Deerfield usually comes back with, we want you to reduce X amount more, yeah. and then submit it, and there's another review that happens. So well, I don't about, know if we how, need to how, meet. We can't do the 11th. That didn't work out for people. I can't do the 11th. OK. Um, how about the 10th? 10th is a Wednesday. I could do the 10th. No, actually, I'm going to be in. Um, I apologize. That whole week, I'm in Florida. Oh. But if you guys need to meet, go ahead. I mean, um, it's, it's business. It's not like I'm tucking my toes in the sand. Oh. Yeah, and the same thing with the next week. I'm in Syracuse, but, you know, I'm sure Tommy can speak for me. He knows exactly how my brain works. Well, I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, we should. I really think we should meet either that that week of the fifteenth sometime, uh, because that's a week before Sunderland's. Um, Tell me. So Tell me the eighteenth didn't work for most people. I don't. I don't. I. The eighteenth. The eighteenth. We have. Did we set that for sure? I believe so, but okay. you. I have questions on both eighteenth and twenty second. Yeah. Um, I know we had penciled it in, but. Yeah. Um, have you guys posted it yet? No, no. We haven't decided which day it was, the 18th or the 22nd. Well, we can. This could go force your decision. Doodle pool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> But we, we have to meet before the before Sunderland's town meeting. Um, Tuesday the 16th. That's the way we think on the Yeah. You already know. <laughs> Do we want to temporarily pick the 18th and then you can go back and find out? Yeah. I. That could force us to do the 22nd. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to sort out we have to sort out the budget for sure, at least in my mind. Yep. So let's um, before and that's a if we that's a week before you know the Sunderland meeting. So I'm gonna pencil in four eighteen at six p.m. for now. Yeah. Okay. And then if we need to change that, uh, we can just yeah talk. Yeah. Know, that's great. All right. Uh, good. Um, Anything else? Motion to adjourn. I motion we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to adjourn.